Thanks, Sarah. Uh, actually, I'm going to have the panel come up. We'll all take a seat. And can we queue up the video that we have while everybody's sitting down? Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. <laughs> <laughs> so, we all have some course correcting to do at times. Sometimes we're the lighthouse, sometimes we're the ship. Um, so I'm actually going to let our panelists uh, introduce our, themselves. We've got uh, a couple of large publishers. Facebook and Google are with us, and I think um, that's representative of a lot of uh, big direct deals that clients are working on. Um, we've got an agency to represent all agencies in the universe, and we have a client that represents all clients in the universe. So a lot of weight on your shoulders. Me? I'll start. Hi, I'm, I'm Scott Simons. I'm the managing director of uh, AKQA's media practice, and that includes media, search, and uh, data. Hi, I'm Cecilia Wogan Silva, and I run Google's agency development team, specifically in the US for creative agency development. Hello, hi, I'm uh, George Ruiz, and I'm the agency measurement lead for Facebook. And uh, my role is to specifically help to actually develop like uh, new research uh, uh, prototypes with, uh, with agencies, but also a lot of internal work in terms of helping to deliver better ad effectiveness solutions for campaigns and uh, upcoming research. And I'm Carol Cruz, currently the CMO of Tough Mudder, but before that I was head of digital for the Coca-Cola company and the CMO at ESPN. So I guess if I'm representing all clients, <laughs> um, I, at least I've got CPG media and events covered. So uh, I'll, I'll just start by saying this, this panel is neither a publisher's guide of how to go around agencies, uh, <laughs> nor an agency's guide of how to defend themselves against publishers. Um, this is a realistic view of some of the changing landscape. Um, and I just want to start with uh, maybe to give everybody the, the lay of the land um, of how prevalent these types of deals uh, exist out there. And I think there's maybe two flavors of, of direct deals. There's an actual direct deal where there's a, a, mon a contractual relationship management that's happening direct between client and publisher. And I guess when we talk about publishers, we're also talking about um, you know, ad tech companies to a large extent as well. Um, then there's a, another flavor of direct deal where uh, the client's involved, they're, they're influential, but the agency is still managing and executing the, the deal. And there's you know, sometimes different uh, monetary uh, uh, arrangements for that. So how prevalent are those deal, st those deal structures out there? I guess we'll start with, with Scott on the agency side. Sure, I, I think um, I think there are all kinds of prevalent. I think I think the you know there's both the media partnership and then now we have this. Everybody's seen the Kawaja chart, obviously, of, of tech providers. And I think you know honestly that that might be some of the harder ones to solve right now is is the um, the direct tech uh, work with clients because sometimes that can be something we could help clients with. But uh, you know I think it's it's been around since the beginning of digital, been around forever in media. Um, it's certainly not getting smaller uh, to, to uh, Rashad's speech. Uh, you know, it's more chaotic than ever now. There's more need to establish your value equation, whether you're an agency, whether you're a publisher, to get your voice heard. Uh, so it, it's there, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to go away, so it's a matter of how you sort of manifest your behavior and, and, and work with your client or work with your publishers or work with your technologies to, to sort of demonstrate an operational ecosystem. Yeah, I, um, I think it is very prevalent to see that these deals are being struck directly with clients and with um, major partners like a Google or a Facebook. Um, you know, it's no surprise that 12 years ago nobody was doing deals with agencies from within Google because Google was sort of an invisible entity. And so I think as a result of that legacy, you see a lot of the early development of deals began with clients. Um, and in the latter years, it's been much more focused in, in aggregate form with agencies. So now we do have a combination, and I think we believe in both of those. Um, you know, I, I thought um, the, the point that was made earlier around, look, this is not a, 
a zero-sum game. You know, this is, uh, I think that there's this old philosophy around the tragedy of the commons. If everybody's worrying about their own personal flock, their own personal herd, you know, you're going to screw up the pasture. You know, so the idea is we have to kind of nurture it from all sides, um, and there's, yeah, there's a reason to, to manage the entire ecosystem. So, so can, can I ask, um, I, I guess it's a, a challenging question to ask for an honest answer to, but um, are agencies failing in some areas? Is that, is that one of the reasons why publishers and ad tech companies are going direct to clients, or what are some of the other dynamics that are at play there? Uh, well, I think, I think back to the, uh, one of the earlier points uh, that Rashad mentioned is that um, clients, wa clients want to be able to understand wh what's going on in the marketplace, and oftentimes, you know, they'll come and ask him for uh, multiple advice. So in this situation, for example, uh, where I think some of the most productive conversations I've had in, in the past couple of months is when both my client partners as well as my agency partners were having the same exact planning and measurement discussions in the same room at the same time. And those, those are often the conversations to where we know that we have to deliver against solid business objectives, but it can't, it can't be after the fact in terms of, well, campaign ran, what happened? It has to be really solid up front, and those are the places to where when actually everybody's committed to the same type of um, like business objectives, that's where all this stuff can flow pretty well. Um, and, and there will always be a different type of approaches, but I think this is something to where by forcing the conversation to be integrated across all the different aspects is really more productive on the long run. Well, Carol, and I gotta say, you know, everyone mindset. forgets the client point of view here yeah. is like, you know, without the client, there is no money, there is no advertising, <laughs> and everyone feels like you can't talk to my client from an agency perspective, and the client's like, I just don't want everything to be through a filter. I, I always like to go direct to publishers. Part of it is I just wanted to learn. So when I was at Coca-Cola, leading digital, you know, whole world, so many new things, my agency didn't really want me to go direct to publishers. And I kept saying, I'll tell you when I'm going. I will never talk about money, but I have to learn. And they need to learn my business. And, you know, sometimes that direct conversation is really valuable without an agency filter. And it wasn't a lack of trust. It was just knowing that direct conversations were going to yield better results with a publisher. And um, a client might hear a publisher or a technology provider say something that the client's been thinking about for the future that the agency may not quite even know about yet, but you can just leapfrog and make these advances so much faster. And so I think you're right. The, the magic is when you have an agency and a publisher, a technology company, and the client together, so you're all working on it at the same time. Because remember, from a client perspective, the competition between a, uh, an agency and a publisher, the client doesn't kind of care about, quite honestly. It's a bit of a not my prom, work it out. Um, but in the meantime, don't let that stop us doing the best marketing possible and you know, finding that win-win between a customer, uh, a consumer, and a, and a client partner. And so that, that was always my frustration is like, let's just do some great marketing and direct conversations are almost always better. Yeah, I, I second that point. I also really believe it goes to this principle around an ecosystem can do so much more together. Um, that collaboration between uh, a Google and a client and their agencies to actually make sense of the data to say what is the insight and what does this actually mean for us. I, your question around are agencies falling down, I would say agencies, clients, publishers, everybody falls down when you get into this no it's mine game. Um, because all you're doing is slowing down the process, and the failure has everything to do with not being able to move as rapidly yeah. as possible. So, so I'd ask then, again, Google and Facebook are typically two of the media companies that are almost always on these joint business partnership or, or direct strategic plans. So what do you guys do in particular to ensure that there is an interrelationship and that all parties are working together and that there's, there's no perception on the agency side that you know, you're infringing on their turf and you're, you're you know, going over, over their heads? I mean, you know, you've pitched ideas to the agency. Sometimes the agency decides it's not the right idea for the client. Publishers are going to go to the client anyway. So what are the policies within your organizations to play nice in the sandbox in that regard? Uh, well, I'd say for me, it's, it's critical that, um, like, I've always made sure that we have our uh, agency partners at, at the table. Um, and it's important for a couple of different reasons. Um, I, I'm a former uh, agency veteran. I spent 10 years uh, at Ogilvy. And one of the most fundamental things I've always believed is that strategic planning is so cornerstone to initially making sure that when ideas come to life and you execute them into a campaign, 
that's something where everybody has a, a, an equal seat at the table because ultimately, if I don't have the right creative matched against my right targeted campaigns, it's gonna be very difficult. There has to be this component between, I need to have the right idea come to life, but I need to have that executed into a proper campaign. That means strategic planning, communications architecture, proper creative briefs, proper campaign implementation, media targeting, and measurement. And unfortunately, you know, these are things that, you know, you know, when I started doing CRM, you know, many, many years ago, it was a lot easier to do. Now it's many more, com now it's more complex, more synchronous. But what it really means is that when we talk about e uh, ecosystem, when we talk about uh, different things about like learning, it really is, how do we all try to do the same campaign execution with a realistic workflow? And that's a tricky part because when do I do strategic planning? When do I do uh, measurement plans? When do I do research? And it just means that we just have to be comfortable that the people that are managing campaigns have explicitly clear you know, uh, uh, briefs, but also the people are gonna be executing the campaign, the junior talent, can have the push to be learning more traditional marketing and research techniques so that all of us are able to do more synchronous uh, execution. And it, it's, it's just it's more work, but I think it's worth doing. And I agree that bringing in the creative agency, because as Rashad said, you can have the best targeted media placement in yeah. the world, but if your storytelling isn't there and it's not a relevant message, then it's all for naught. All that incredible work to build the best possible media plan will fail. And I do think it's important. With TV, you can buy your TV and then you can kind of toss it over the fence and then the creative shop can develop spots. But in the digital world, the creative should inform the buy should inform the creative and it really should be all together, which of course makes it even messier and harder to stay on time, um, but better to get that measurement in place in time. But I mean, it actually gets far more complex um, when you start adding creative agencies sometimes, right? A CRM shop or a shopper marketing shop, a creative agency. And I, and I think we're seeing more ideation coming from publishers as well, right? So it's not just about yeah. media direct deals. We're, we're also seeing, you know, I think we're all familiar with the phrase, you know, data is the new black. And, you know, publishers tend to be able to bring that data. Ad tech companies can bring that data. Agencies want to hold on to that data. Um, some people talk about, you know, the, the old um, sort of big idea being dead. But, you know, isn't the ideation that's coming from publishers and a lot of those really large deals part of that big idea, sort of that new storytelling, I, like Rashad was talking about? Well, I, I think it's complementary. Um, I, I think there's also, uh, it, there's a very fundamental time and a need for when a big idea is necessary. It's as a business, when you need to do a, a very important pivot as part of a business strategy, it's, it's not easy, it's very hard work, but there's always be a necessary need in order to pivot your business where you will require a communications architecture in order to deliver the big idea. But where things like, I mean, in my personal view, where the, um, you know, the, the, the you need, a big idea for big execution and big work and big problems. But when you have you know, small ideas, many things, you need to produce content and, and actually have a lot more flow in your campaign, this is the combination to where I may need to have one campaign where I have a big umbrella, whereas in other uh, small campaigns, I actually need to make sure I produce fresh, relevant, targeted content so I can remain authentic. And that's where like, you, you, know, you can have both, but you need to have very clear uh, briefs in order to set, you know, what do you want me to do for you? I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, the, the art of the brief, I think, yeah. is declining, unfortunately. I think we get big data and we focus so much on that that I, I think sometimes in all the ability to target that we actually forget about a really compelling brief. Yeah. And then there's a lot of clients who have a media brief and a creative brief as separate briefs, mm -hmm. which is almost incomprehensible. Why would you not have a communications brief? And of course, you can have executional considerations as it pertains to each of the disciplines. But um, in that briefing process and that kickoff process, you really should have all together. Yeah, yeah and, you and absolutely must. I just was going to say, I think um, you asked about the role of ideation from big organizations. And I, I, there is a role for insight development because that big old mountain of data that I just shove over at Scott <laughs> is useless to him unless we can kind of go at it collaboratively to break it down and say, well, what's in here and what does this mean? How does this complement what you already have? I believe that co-ideation is critical. You know, maybe Scott doesn't have the opportunity to go through all of that data necessarily in a solitary way and that there's some benefit to us doing it together. And the same is true in terms of the ideas. You know, if we're doing those together, it ends up that we actually are way more strategically aligned. And so what that ends up doing is going back to your earlier question around 
how do we align better between client direct and agency is that the concepts that are being developed in partnership with agencies are also coming to life in conversation directly with clients. And so those two things are starting to feed each other. So, so, so that's a great example of when it works, right? What, what happens when it doesn't work? What happens when, and, and I mean, we've all seen these situations when the agency feels that, you know, a publisher is infringing on their strategic vision, their planning, their ideation. Um, is this, I mean, I, I imagine this happens sometimes. How do, you, how do you deal with that as an agency? And, and how, do you, how do you keep the relationship with the publisher in good standing while trying to all work towards the same end goal for the client? Yeah, I don't want to be Pollyanna. I mean, I think that happens less. I think there was six or seven or 10 years ago before we'd sort of re reestablished that an agency's can add value to a marketing relationship. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was more challenging then. I think the hardest then can be when new publishers or big publishers, you know, want to be assertive with their ideas and their relationships with clients. Even, you know, even our, our biggest relationship where we have the most agency people and where we have the most marketers on the client side, um, there's still a big role for the Googles or Facebooks in those, in those places. I think um, if you really, you know, be absolutely candid about the challenge, it's when, it's when the agenda for monetary growth with a Google or a Facebook feels like it's exceeding our, you know, what we'd like to plan. If, 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 mm -hmm. if, if Google, as an example, yeah. no offense, Cecilia, right. says I want, you know, 10 million next year, um, to client A, and we feel like, well, maybe 10 million is the right number, but at least like to get to that in a holistic planning cycle versus an upfront cycle. I think honestly, that's kind of the most challenging place we're in. But again, I mean, so we have an open conversation, we figure that out, and if, hopefully I have as much uh, voice with the CMO as, as, as Google does, and we have that conversation and see if they merit it or not, or make sure we get the most value out of that $10 million commitment that we could. Uh, there's a lot of value these guys can bring. You just want to make sure you have that, as, as we said, in this, in this triangular conversation where you make sure that, that agency, consumer, client, right. partner is all, is all included so we are maximizing that. So, I mean, there are times when there's that, that tension, but that should be good tension. Like we said, if we're not pushing, if we're not saying this industry needs to grow, I want to grow 15, 20% next year. It's going to take some people that can move some things and do some things to be aggressive. I'd like to think I'm aggressive, but I'd like, you know, yeah. like to make sure to be a challenging them too. Yeah, you gotta set the goals together, but then you have to moderate them. But yeah, I'll, I have to agree, Scott, it comes down to the money. It's always <laughs> about the money. That is where it always goes wrong. You know, the growth goals that you have in mind versus the growth goals that I have in mind. Or I'll say, like just throwing something else on the table is, oh, I'll give you all of your creative ideation, all of your insights development, and in fact, why don't I just manage that soup to nuts <laughs> for you? That's when it starts to become a major problem. That is no longer an awesome example of you know, what could be done, intended to be inspirational, to set the stage for the rest of the industry's transformation. It becomes incredibly competitive. And that's where it starts to fall apart. When clients go, how about if I just give you my money directly because I'm not sure if I trust my agency, don't tell them I said that. <laughs> um, and that's usually where it falls apart when a, when a seller smells an opportunity it's very nearsighted as opposed to looking at the larger, you know, thinking long term, thinking five years out, what, is this, what would be the consequence of doing something like that? Um, it's always the money. It's always the money. You know, I, I guess I want to uh, have Carol give us some client view. You know, you, you've been at organizations that have had uh, multiple agencies in a portfolio, uh, work directly on media and, and other marketing services, and. Um, and everything in between. So what, what are some of the dynamics that force or, or drive a client to decide that I'm gonna bring X service in house sure. or I'm gonna work in partnership with my agency? I think clients like to think they wanna bring things in house, um, but then they remember that they're actually a beverage company or a sports <laughs> network or, you know, so it sounds really good because it's, you know, we're, most of us in this room are kind of type A and we want control. So especially when it gets muddy and you feel like you're, you know, babysitting your, your agency fights and you're, you're tired of playing that traffic cop, you're like, oh, screw it, I'm going to bring it in-house. You know, and that sounds really good for about three months. <laughs> and then you try to hire the right people and you try to manage them. And then you realize that what you bring in-house, it's hard to keep it fresh because that outside perspective is so valuable. The pushback that your agency should be giving you, the innovation that they should be bringing, and the, the, really that, that creative tension, it really makes the work better. 
And so I think you know, the best thing you can do is not put your client in a position, it's almost <laughs> what Rashad said about um, people leave because of bosses and colleagues. Don't put your client in that position where they think, I'm so tired of playing referee between my agencies uh, and I'm tired of the finger pointing or the delays in schedule, blaming it on one another. Like if you take that away, then I don't think most clients really want to bring their agency in house. It's almost the, just out of sheer frustration. You're like, fine, I'm just gonna bring it in house. Knowing that that's probably not really the best long term solution, but you just get so fed up, you try it. And so I think the best clients work on nurturing really good relationships. A, they kind of don't tolerate maybe some of the, the squabbles between siblings, right? Um, you make sure that you have a good briefing process, that you have all this, the stakeholders at the table, that you clearly set up roles and responsibilities, that you continuously reinforce, reinforce of what each agency's role is going to be. When you bring publishers in, that you make it clear so that the partners don't feel like they, they can start. You know it's that kind of territory grab. But I kind of think it's up to the client to play that role and set those guidelines. And if, and if someone's kind of misbehaving, you've got to kind of stop it fast. Um, the other thing which is hugely controversial and probably everyone in this room hates um, is looking at some performance-based compensation because I know no one in here likes that um, because it's pure accountability and it's hard to have part of your compensation be uh, against a shared objectives because you can't control your whole destiny. But I know Coca-Cola has done a lot of work on this and when you have the different partners have some of that comp compensation based on a common goal that if the team works together, you have a shared goal, that that will give you, you know, an upside on your compensation. You know, I think that can work. It's incredibly hard to do well, but um, when, does well, when it is done well, it tends to say, okay, we're all in this together. We're all gonna benefit if we, if we reach these objectives. And obviously the more measurable and um, numeric those objectives are, the better that works. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up performance. So I'm gonna change the, the, the topic to performance a little bit. Um, marketers are still struggling with standard KPIs, um, trying to validate whether digital really is moving the needle or how much it's moving the needle. Um, a lot of the larger, larger clients can afford the media mix modeling exercises to incorporate digital data in there. Um, where does the agent, and, and that's typically, you know, kind of the agency's realm, not the media entity's realm but more and more media companies, are, or the larger ones at least, are getting involved in helping to strategize, co-fund, um, and otherwise coordinate some of that measurement planning. Um, where does each party fit? And, and e even on the client side, I think consumer insights and analytics groups are growing at most organizations yeah. that we work with. Yeah. Um, so what's the role of the client? What's the role of the agency? Who's in the driver's seat? Because everybody can't be in the driver's seat. And I, I guess I'm gonna start with Scott, because. You know, typically that's an agency's role. Um, it, well, it's been the fastest growing part of my group has been data science and analytics growth. So there's definitely appetite for it. Um, I'd say it goes across the gamut from clients having no resource to having a lot of resource but not, might, might not be connected to marketing. So, so I think there's almost always an opportunity to grow that conversation and to better design and define a client's goals with a measurement plan, a set of KPIs. Uh, and to that point, you know, even my clients that have substantial analytics groups, econometrics groups, they're typically, they're working with their trade, they're working with product, they're working in some other area. And, and sometimes they'll be kind enough to share that with us. That's great. And we can join our marketing investment and our marketing measurement plan to the business plan or to the other outputs. But as, as much, as, much as, as often as not, there isn't a join. So um, I think I think there needs to be going forward. I mean, as, as we talk about data management platforms and that, you know, my idea of the future of media is it looks much more like a distributed dynamic CMS or it looks much more like CRM with all the ability we have to target and to create those messaging that actually match that targeting. Well, suddenly that brings CRM a lot closer to media. That brings trade. That brings a bunch of groups that, that weren't sitting together together. That, I don't think that's happening very well right now, but it needs to happen better, faster, and I think, you know, smaller companies or companies that want to leapfrog by starting to integrate these things better, I think we'll, we'll have an opportunity. Those that do the best in measurement quite often have done it in, in silos internally and haven't applied that to digital, haven't applied it across channel, haven't applied, applied it to, you know, to non-digital channels, whatever. So it's a massive opportunity, and I think we're at 
stage one or two of, of a truly sophisticated, integrated marketing portfolio, whatever that is, talking to whatever enterprise business statistics analysis yeah, there is there. I mean, I'm, I'm a measurement guy, and I, I, I can honestly tell you that cross media is it's just hard to do. Um, the, and, and the funny thing is, is that the more that you dig into this is there's the, the research approaches for how to measure these things are there. It doesn't mean that they're, they're easy or they're, they're going to be necessarily always affordable, but the research itself is probably often easier to do than the complexity of integrating all these things. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what could happen. I used to have one, one of my large clients years ago, um, they had commissioned like a, a, you know, a multi-year engagement with, with, with a major partner where they had a mixed model across media study, a brand lift study, uh, a traditional brand tracker, and then an uh, attitudinal uh, segmentation study. Same research supplier, many di different client owners, many different agency owners, and nobody was talking to each other. And then I get a call one day that says, hey, listen, all the research came in and nothing is talking, <laughs> everything's completely different. One shows you know, digital having zero impact, one shows having all the impact. So guess what happened? I had to come in and kind of refit all the existing, like there was never a question of what the methodology was. It was always about how come they're telling me different stories. So this also kind of goes back to like, you know, the right briefing and the right expectations, but the research itself also has to be integrated into this because in many cases, most folks will be willing to accept simpler research methodologies that have very sound expectations and follow through in terms of what they were looking at. So it's often less to don't, don't try to solve the whole world. It's just, there is no magic bullet for cross media. No. But if you compartmentalize the problem and structure it, you know, this is the places to where like, you know, all the, all the things you mentioned, what makes the right client, my toughest, my hardest clients that made me learn always had those rules and in places. So when we actually de de delivered the best kinds of research, we actually set up to say, today, let's talk about looking for the value of digital. Then let's talk about the integration of digital plus search. Then let's talk about the brand creative. Let's talk about the, the attitudinal impact. Then let's look at the long-term economic value. Then let's validate it with household level matches. It's about that, that stepwise approach that says, it's okay that one thing works well, maybe one's not so perfect, but let's set it up against it as a framework to align to the, to the entire advertising workflow. And that's, to me, the more important piece on how to approach it. The other thing I think, it, and I've worked at companies where the research has been incredible and you had attribution models and your marketing mix models and you actually had enough volume to bring in search and digital, social not so much, you know, but getting there. But the fact is that that is backward facing data. And so, you know, we all have to be marketers as well and say, okay, back in the last 12 months, this might have been the right marketing mix model. But technology is changing so fast, our consumer connection points and the way we build our brands and how we do our best storytelling is happening so fast that if you get so tied down in the data, you're actually not looking forward and thinking about you know, the consumer mm -hmm. and how you're gonna actually make the best impact. And is your storytelling delivered at the right place at the right time with the right context? And so I, we, of course that is all important, but I think too much focus on that um, turns us into all analytics folks instead of marketers, and we kind of forget about actually what makes a consumer impact. And, and so, I, I, think that, I think we need a little balance. In I, that. I think that's right. I think I think we you tend to use data in a reductive optimization form, which tends to grind something out versus open something up. I think right. I think data is getting so usable now, platforms so flexible that I mean, there's a lot of opportunity in. in predictive analytics and future looking analytics, especially if you get all that stuff organized yeah. right now. I do, I do think it comes back to our, our conversation earlier and still the value of the creator of the big idea. I do think you need a North Star, especially if you're redefining a brand or defining a brand. I think all the data in the world crushed will sort of take you to the past construct of that brand versus, uh, you know, and it costs money to conquest or reinvent something. So you have to invest in that, that won't be optimized into. But I think, I think the power of data is getting even greater, like to, put to your point, Carol, um, you know, I think you need that creative North Star and then you need to think of data in a constructive forward-looking way, which is fairly different than how we, we've done it to date. We have so much hygiene needs just to get the back-looking working right that we're not, not quite there yet. And oh, by the way, you know, our consumers are controlling the message just as much as everyone in this room is. Right. And so, you know, factor. again, we can't control the message completely because um, consumers have such a strong stage to tell their side of the story or their point of view or their user-generated data or c content that um, you really would have to weave that in, which of course is impossible to model. Um, and so 
I think the analytics are super important, but certainly within context of the creative storytelling and what the consumer says. And I think sometimes we, we miss that balance. And you know, as an industry, I think we, the, the pendulum swings from it's all about the storytelling, it's all about the creative, and then it gets incredibly big data centric. And you know, we've, we've been going back and forth, and of course the magic is all those things count. Um, in the right balance and, and that we just don't forget there's a consumer there. Uh, years ago, I had a client that, uh, a really valuable lesson that, that she taught me was, she said, you know, you're the, you're the research and the analyst. You, you know, your, your job is to tell me what happened, but I want you, when you come back to me, I want you to come in with a strategic planner to tell me what else to do. Right, because it's not just the insights. Right. The, that's the data is all about the insights. It's what you do with those insights yeah. that actually make the difference. Yep. So guys, we, we have less than 10 minutes left and we can't end the panel without talking about a growing trend of large marketers developing their own trading desks and bringing in some programmatic, um, whether it's uh, the strategy, the actual implementation of it, uh, the different uh, variations of that model, whether, whether they're doing it in conjunction with their, um, with their agencies, uh, whether they're building their own data management platform or actually going all out and, and doing you know, all of the programmatic trading. So, can we just touch on, and I'm gonna start with Scott because you're on the agency side and you guys probably see a lot of that. Um, what's the trend there and what are the pitfalls on the client side and what is your, what's your agency view on whether it's a threat? Is it you know, taking a, away some margin that you know, was planned to be agency margin over the next five to 10 years? Uh, well, definitely don't see it as a threat. I see it as an inevitable evolution of marketing, so I think it's exciting. And to sort of take the Rashad perspective, it's, it's a growth engine, it, it's a reality, we need to figure out how to work with it. And I think the next part is, um, you know, is evolution of media and, and back to the data story. Uh, there's so much power in first party data. And, you know, we're sort of fortunate as, as an integrated agency that very often we also build a client's website and we can tag it and understand it. And, and that's, you know, that's where I see the greatest opportunity for us. When we can um, build an ecosystem for a client where we can build a robust first party data engine and then we can do our media buying based on audience segments and, and occasions within audience segments and the what, where, when models on those people, that, that's a very exciting opportunity. So that, that for me, you know, I love having a programmatic platform. I love, you know, the way it's tended to manifest itself is we end up building DMPs with our client to facilitate that. And you know, frankly, I couldn't be more excited about that as an evolution of our media practice, as an, ev as an evolution of media. So, so essentially helping to develop a DMP that's owned by your client, operated by the agency on behalf of the client. Is that the model you see? That's a successful here? model that, that we're doing now. I, I'm, I'm very happy when we can manage something like that for the client because the opportunity to create results that are substantially different, better, more personalized, more segmented, um, and, and more efficient versus our end goal has been, that's, 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 that's our best driver for that, yeah. Carol, what, what, do, you, what do you see happening from a clients? Actually, side? I think that solution Scott's recommending is kind of the win-win. The client wants the data, that's just it. You know, the more data can enhance your product development, can enhance your go-to-market strategy, all those good things. And I think that's, you know, that's a big impetus. I mean, there's a financial question as well, but at the end of the day, if you can make the finances work and have a shared model, like Scott's suggesting, um, I think that's the win-win, because I think at the, what clients really, really want, or think they want, again, you know, too much data, I can't sing the song Rashad said, but something about, <laughs> you know, you got too much data and, and you need the insights. Um, you know, so it, it is that, and it's getting that data, and of, and then the, but the agency is probably better placed to take that data and create the insights. Because again, it's not data for data's sake, it's really those insights that can inform the business holistically of the client. I mean, not just from a media marketing standpoint, but product development, go to market, shopper, et cetera. Um, so I think that could be the win-win. But, but isn't a lot of the dynamic, the ownership of the data and the control of the data? Right, so it, I mean, a lot, it of, a lot of the- It sounds like in Cher's model, uh, in, in Scott's model, the client is owning that yep. data. They're happen to be sharing it, say, with AKQA in this, right. to, to or, get and, that and value may, add that the agency And maybe is sharing offering. is the wrong word, maybe the right word is making it accessible for use on their behalf. Right. Because that's, that's really, I think, the dynamic that's happening. That's it. Right? So um, we, we've got a few minutes left. Bef before we open up for questions, I wanna ask one last question to everybody in the panel. Is there an area in the industry that is currently underserved by all parties? So is there an area that 
the agencies, the media companies, the ad tech companies, clients, that everybody's struggling to figure out a solution to right now, and nobody really has domain over that area? Mobile. Integration. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's frustration with, I do what I just said too infrequently, and the, the challenge is working across, I don't blame clients, they have these enterprises that are very functional, that, that have existed for that way for 20 years, but to start trying to talk about, no, you really ought to share data, there's a massive opportunity here if we start to break down these silos. You know, that, that's something that's gonna take years to do, that'll be frustrating me for years to come, no, no question about it. I mean, my solution right now is to start to try a cost benefit and have a very needy, media-centric payback, which is, let me build a data platform, let me just use it for media. If I can do this and find your audiences better, create a conversation more efficiently than having to go out and reconquest or having to do less targeted ads, then that, you know, that can pay for this. And then let's add your shopper or your coupon or, or your trade or your other CRM or your other channels, and we'll reap even more reward for it, but rather than trying to get 10 stakeholders to agree right now and create this massive, you know, meeting set for the next two years just to, just to struggle to get that one out. I feel like there, I, I love Rashad's point about cockroaches. I mean, I, again, a former agency person, I, I appreciated the point, which is it's an incredibly adaptive industry, and there are so many new and interesting specialties that are coming up, but the greatest challenge is nobody's getting paid to actually be, um, to, to share an OKR or KPI, and nobody's actually taking that leadership role of trying to bring it all together in partnership with their clients. It's the clients who have to bear the onus, bear the burden to do all of that work. Um, and I don't think that's healthy for the industry ultimately, and so nobody's making a grab for that except for maybe more and more you're seeing the consultancy step in. Um, and that's an, interesting, that's an interesting trend over the last year and a half, especially in terms of the acquisitions that they've started to pick up and trying to acquire their own data sets and so on. So um, I don't think it's fully developed, and it's been talked about for 30 years, and nobody still really owns it. Yeah, what, what worries me is uh, whenever I talk to my my agency planning friends, and especially some of the more junior folks, is making sure that they have the right training and programs so that they can actually train the next future role of planners to actually be very fluent in high-level strategic planning for communications architecture, but also have the wits to actually go down for systems and integration in a very practical level to where you need to have more people that can be comfortable talking about how do you build a brand. You don't need to know all the mechanics, but you need to understand just at a high level. What's, you know, if you come and ask me, help me build my brand, it could be five different things. Right. But I need to understand very quickly like what I need to do to make sure that we deliver on that task, but I have to have the understanding and, and the principles to say, well, what's realistic when I actually make this come to life? And that's gonna be whether it's, you know, it's do, I need, do I need to have you know, the right creative, the, you know, the right uh, creative pretesting, or is it a matter of, you know, data fluency or programmatic or anything around mobile is I need to understand that ultimately when I hand something to you as a work product, that is not just a concept in theory, but it's a very pragmatic yes. thing that says, we'll get halfway there, but here's what I think is realistic and what we can learn tomorrow. For me, it's, it's mobile advertising. I mean, Sarah showed that slide of the growth of mobile advertising and it's so technology driven. There's so many technology providers. It, from a client side, it's almost overwhelming how many technology providers. There's a lot of redundancy there. We actually know consumers don't like mobile advertising. And so um, it, I, it's, it's tough to manage on the client side. It's tough to know what's right. I don't necessarily know anyone really has the right answer yet. And so I think that's kind of for the future, for the next few years, if those numbers are gonna grow the way Sarah showed, that's something we're all gonna have to figure out together and how we play um, well in the sandbox together um, to really get, um, not just throw money at it, but have it be a really effective advertising medium. Great, so guys, I know we could talk about this all day. We've, we've wrapped up our time. Um, I think this is a great example of some of the, the symptoms of a lot of transformation um, from what I guess we will all from now on call the cockroach manifesto. <laughs> um, so I think we have some time for a couple questions from the audience. We actually have time for maybe one question one from the One question audience. from the audience. It's gotta be a good one. A lot of weight on your shoulders. Who has the best question? The winner. How you doing? My name's David Johnson. I'm with Ed Coney and Direct. Uh, so we've seen a lot of consolidation over the years with technology and data and the opportunity to buy cross-channel. From all of your perspectives, what has been the challenge in buying cross-channel over the years? Because when you have talked to an agency maybe 10 years ago, they would say, 
I'm not going to give this one partner all of my money. Right? And today, you see technologies that are more integrated and offer excuse me, <coughs> uh, strategies that, are more, uh, that provide opportunities for ad sequencing and utilization of data. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on uh, what is the difficulty in buying cross-channel today? From a measurement side, I can tell you it's just, it's, <laughs> it, 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 we, we, we've been talking about this for many years and it's just difficult to do because you know, this, on, this question kind of underlines all the problems and all the things we're trying to address around you know, why, why is it so difficult to have a scalable single source methodology that can say, I'll be able to deliver you like at a currency level, everything that can show from television to print to radio to digital to mobile. It, these things can be done, but then it's very difficult to scale them and who's gonna fund them in the industry? That's true. Uh, yeah. When I was at ESPN, ESPN did a great study across channel and it was across all the ESPN channels, you know, from Xbox Live to mobile. There were 17 different research partners who participated in that study. The results were amazing, super useful for both the advertisers as well as for me as a marketer, but 17 different research vendors to kind of look at one holistic look across the channels is a little extreme and a little crazy. I think that's why clients tend to go to um, companies like ESPN because within that infrastructure, that, that publisher can look and understand how you're getting the reach and frequency you may want across that publisher's channels mm -hmm. from TV to mobile to digital to print to Xbox, et cetera. And I think that's why, because you actually have a belief that you're getting, um, you could either tell a, li a linear story across channels or over time, or you know that you're getting kind of the reach and frequency that you I want. Think, I think that's exactly right. I, I think ESPN is the exception where the brand is so strong that you value that across any channel and you want it, whether it's mobile, TV, digital, or whatever. I think, um, you know, I think that's not the case in many other things. You might buy CNN and think uh, the TV is great, but I'd rather be on Yahoo News or something else. So I think the reason is, I, I don't know where to take the Google channels. Their channels are very different. Just because you're doing Google search doesn't mean you want to be on YouTube, doesn't mean you want to be on GDN. Right. I'm sure you might beg to differ, but, you know, but it means there, there, there's different opportunities. Part of the media planner buyer's job is to make sure you represent the best segment or version of that content and context for each channel. So yes, it'd be great if ABC News, ABC.com, and the Disney properties were this perfect suite of things. You know, if the value is great, yes, we might think about it as a cross-channel buy, but really, I guess we'd like to think that we, if we can build a better cross-channel buy through multiple properties, that's what we would do. Yeah. All right, thanks, guys.